we're going to uh, maybe we'll get started. I see that we have nine participants and hopefully we're going to get a few more. And uh, anyway, I, I want to welcome Gretchen Berg here to the Rocky River Library. And I welcome all of you in attendance tonight, too. Um, I'm just curious um, if you could type in the chat box, people, if you don't mind, uh, if you say yes, if you read the book. And if you didn't, that's OK, too. If you could just type in yes and make sure it goes to everyone. Yeah, if everyone has read it, then we can talk about some of the spoilers, because I think that's I'm really, really particular about not spoiling anything. Okay. So I'm reluctant to, you know, discuss certain aspects of the book. But yeah, but so if everybody's read it, that would be fun. Yeah. And if you haven't, it's not a big deal, but we're going to recommend that you do read it. Uh, I see that Carol has read it. Stacy read it. Um, Sarah is reading it now. There's the one that recommended the book to me. Elaine has read Thank it. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, it says Kaminsky, I'm probably not saying that correct, uh, has read it, which is great. Elaine has read it. So it, it sounds like the majority of us have read the book. So, oh, Valerie. Well, Valerie has not read it. We won't, not no spoilers. Just no spoilers. Spoil. And we won't spoil it for you, no. Um, yeah, and actually my favorite parts of the book that I probably shouldn't talk about because I would probably spoil it for <laughs> I know. And I don't want to do that. Um, but anyway, we welcome Gretchen and she's going to do some reading from her book for us. And then um, hopefully Gretchen, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself first? Sure. Um, I, I graduated with a degree in education and my first uh, student, I think my first student teaching experience, I got really bad headaches. That it was just a lot of little energy coming at me and I'm not emotionally equipped to deal with that on a day to day basis so my hat is off to people who do teach it is it was really exhausting for me. Um, so I, but I did want to I wanted to keep education in my background and I also had a love of travel so um, my work history is, is sort of like a, a melding of those two things I worked as an international student advisor. Um, worked for a couple of universities. I lived in Seattle and uh, my favorite job was uh, I was a program manager for an expedition travel company. They did small ship travel to really amazing destinations. So I got to go to Antarctica wow. and the Galapagos Islands. Yeah, so that was really incredible. So I I feel very, very lucky. And I, it's funny, every time I talk to my parents about, you know, my trips, my mom, I think my mom is like, why don't you write about that, right? You know, write about the traveling. And I'm like, well, God, there's so much. So, um, and I did, um, I wrote, a, they had to call it memoir. I don't like the word memoir to describe what I wrote because it was, it's irreverent and it was humorous and it wasn't, I wouldn't call it a memoir when I hear memoir, I think poignant stories. Um, and that really wasn't what I was going for. Uh, but I, did, I sort of um, chronicled the year and a half that I lived in Northern Iraq teaching English. Okay. So, and it's very, it's very different from the operator. Um, it was my first experience writing anything that was published. So, um, it's, but it's, it's, it's good if it's a, a light sort of humorous view. Um, and if, I think if, if you don't take yourself too seriously, you would enjoy it. <laughs> I have to put that up. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I think we're going to let you read a little bit and then hopefully we'll have some. Okay. Um, for the people who have just started reading it, has anyone finished chapter one? The, per the person who just, was it Valerie who just started reading it? Mm -hmm. Valerie, could you answer? Nod or shake your head. No? Not, okay, so I'll, I'll read chapter one then. Okay. And I'm going to take my glasses off for this. All right. Chapter One of The Operator, December 15th, 1952. Vivian Dalton's worn old ankle boots crunched over the packed snow in front of Friedlanders, the bright lights of the department store spilling right out onto the sidewalk and mixing with the glow of the street lamps. 
Vivian gave a quick, polite wave of a gloved hand to Betty Miller, who caught her eye through the flocked glass of the main display window. Friedlanders fancied itself right up for the holidays with the lights and the bells and whatever it was they put on the window to make it look like it snowed inside. Vivian had heard it called flocked glass, but couldn't tell you what flocked was. She might have guessed something to do with geese, flock, flocked, who knew? Vivian just knew she would have liked to be inside the bright store on the other side of that flocked glass herself, all nice and toasty, instead of out freezing her toes off, walking to work in the boots that might as well have been made of saran wrap for all the good they were doing. Betty Miller didn't have to work, did she? No, she was nice and toasty inside the department store with her two youngest, little Biddy and Charles Jr., waiting in the long line to see Santa Claus, and that didn't surprise Vivian one bit. This year's Santa was a pretty good one, Vivian had to admit. Fat, jolly, and sober, at least, so the Millers were there, and the lines were much longer than they had been last year. Last year, Jimmy Hickson had said Santa's breath smelled like the Sunoco filling station. Jimmy's older brother, Albert, worked at the filling station, so he would know. When she'd heard what Jimmy Hickson said, Betty Miller had been the first mother to boycott the Santa line, and the other mothers quickly followed her lead like they always did. She hadn't bothered with a courtesy phone call, politely explaining to Friedlanders with all her over-enunciated consonants, your Santa Claus seems to be frightfully ahem, embalmed. That would have taken up too much of her time. Vivian didn't know exactly what it was Betty did with her time, but she knew Betty thought her time was more precious than anyone else's. Betty Miller knew the boycott would work and the other mothers knew it and the sued Friedlanders knew they'd better get themselves a new Santa Claus. No matter what little Biddy and Charles Jr. said to sober Santa up there on his shiny red North Pole throne, Vivian Dalton knew the Millers were going to have a marvelous Christmas this year. The Millers had a marvelous Christmas every year. That was the thing about small towns. Everyone knew everyone else's business. Vivian certainly knew everyone's business, but more important, she knew people. Vivian Dalton knew people, that was for certain, and she'd be the first to tell you that. She'd say it was more from intuition than from eavesdropping on people's telephone calls, but her daughter Charlotte would say, no, it's from the eavesdropping. Charlotte joked with her friends, putting on airs for amusement, saying her mother was privy to myriad conversations among the good people of Worcester. Now, privy and myriad were two words Vivian would have used if she'd known what they meant. She wasn't stupid, but her schooling hadn't gone any further than grade eight at Bowman Street School. Vivian never would have seen privy and myriad printed next to the splashy photos in her fashion and movie magazines. Charlotte had to roll her eyes and sigh as she explained to her friends, my mother doesn't trust people who read books. It was a shame Vivian didn't know words like privy and myriad because she would have loved them. They sounded fancy and expensive. They sounded like words the four flushers on the north side of Worcester probably used all the time, even at Bueller's when they were there buying whatever it was they bought there. Their prime rib and lobster claws and bushels of caviar or whatnot Vivian eavesdropped and also did her share of peering into people's shopping carts at the grocery store. Yes, people like the Millers probably used words like privy and myriad at Bueller's. All four of their rich kids probably privy and myriad at all over the place. Little Biddy and Charles Jr. probably used those words when they were talking to sober Santa at Friedlander's. Vivian wasn't thinking about the words she didn't know as she crunched along on her way to work, blowing out little frozen clouds as she exhaled. She was thinking about how glad she was that Betty Miller had seen her wearing her new hat. There had only been one left at Beulah Beckles that afternoon, and Vivian had set it on the counter next to the cash register with shaky, guilty fingers that really should have been pushing the hat money across the counter to the bank teller to put into her savings account instead. She had seen Betty hovering near the fur coats, eyeing the hat hungrily, looking at it like she'd almost eat it for lunch if she could with her pointy little white teeth. Betty Miller's teeth weren't really pointy. That's just how Vivian imagined them. Pointy teeth and a vicious mouth that seemed just as likely to tear the very flesh from your bones as it was to smile and comment on the weather. Vivian had saved for months to buy that hat. Just that one hat. The beautiful hat that she knew hadn't really been made for someone like her, but maybe if she bought that hat for herself, she'd feel a little bit of what the four flushers felt. Worthy of something nice. Boy, if she'd told Edward how much it cost, he would have put her in the lunatic asylum. Betty Miller probably could have bought four or five of those hats that day right there. If they'd had any more, that is. You're lucky, the sales girl, Doris maybe, had said to Vivian as she wrapped the hat in lavender tissue paper. This is our last one. 
Vivian, in her worn out ankle boots but fancy new hat, stepped out of the frigid night air and into the brick building, pulling the door closed behind her with a brrrr before making her way to the cloakroom. She shrugged out of her coat and then carefully removed the beautiful new hat. Doris at Beulah Bechtel's had said it was Prussian blue, but Vivian didn't know what that was. She thought it more looked more like a dark navy. Beulah hired girls from the college and Doris probably went there to study Prussian or something. Either way, the blue complimented Vivian's eyes and she especially liked how the hat dipped low over her right eyebrow on one side. Chick, she'd read in her fashion magazines, pronouncing it chick in her head. She carefully balanced the head on top of her old winter coat on one of the hooks in the cloakroom, then trod over the worn wooden floors into the switchboard room, pulled out her rolling chair and rolled herself back up to the counter to put on her headset. Who takes a wife? She asked Dorothy Hoffman, who was already seated and probably had been for 15 minutes. What? Dorothy pushed the earpiece into her hair behind her ear, turning to face Vivian. Who takes a wife in Farmer in the Dell? Who takes a wife? Is it the sheep? The sheep? Dorothy's penciled eyebrows furrowed into a jagged M on her pale forehead. No, Vivian asked, studying Dorothy's eyebrows. She should have been using brown eyebrow pencil instead of black. Black made her look angry, and Dorothy was probably just a little annoyed, like she always was when Vivian was a little late and then talked about nursery rhymes. Why would the sheep take a wife? I don't know. For some reason, that's what's stuck in my head. Something about the E sound. She turned back to the blank board in front of her and studied it, head tilted to the side. The E takes a wife. It's the farmer who takes a wife, Dorothy said, because even though she was annoyed, she couldn't let Vivian think the sheep took a wife. The farmer, are you sure? Vivian turned back to Dorothy, the doubt plain on her face. It was a nursery rhyme, for Christ's sakes. Why couldn't the sheep take a wife? I don't even think there is a sheep in the rhyme. You're probably thinking of the cheese. The cheese? Yes, honey, the cheese. Vivian turned her attention back to the board, giving a vigorous shake to the dark barrel curls she'd carefully arranged to look like Betty Davis's in All About Eve. Well, the goddamn cheese wouldn't take a wife, she muttered, then started to giggle at the image of two wedges of cheese in front of a pastor, one wearing a veil. It doesn't. Dorothy looked skyward for help like she did sometimes. The cheese stands alone. The cheese stands alone. The cheese stands alone. Dorothy sang the words as she held her hand over the mouthpiece. Every once in a while, there'd be a short in the wiring circuits, and even if the operator remembered to flip the muting switch, you could still hear her voice over the active line. Dorothy had learned her lesson about the wire glitches the hard way and was now extra careful to flip the muting switch and cover her mouthpiece when talking to the other girls in the switchboard room. Worcester's very own mayor had overheard her say the F word, and that had gotten her suspended for two weeks without pay. Vivian never said the F word, but she said all the other ones and was careful to keep her hand over the mouthpiece when she talked to the other girls in the room. Vivian frowned at the board for a moment, back to thinking of that cheese standing alone. She could see it, a wedge of holy Swiss cheese lit up by a stage spotlight all by itself in the middle of her dining room table, a lone cheese, spinster cheese, Suddenly, one of the board's lights blinked before her. She quickly plugged the rear key cord into the jack, flipped the switch, and adjusted her own mouthpiece. Number, please. Vivian was a little bothered by the cheese standing alone in its spotlight, so she connected the call and flipped the mute switch. If she hadn't been distracted, she'd have, she'd have listened in. You can learn a lot that way, she told Edward on one of their first dates. Even though they weren't supposed to, Vivian and the other girls who sat at the switchboards of Ohio Bell on East Liberty Street listened in on the telephone calls. Each and every day, they plugged their cords into the jacks, flipped their switches, and leaned into their headsets to find out what was going on around Worcester. You might say they were the ears of the town. If it were up to Vivian, they'd be a lot more than that. She'd tell you she had a real sharp understanding of people and their personalities, and listening in at Bell only helped that along. She could tell you plenty about situations based on just a few details. For example, when Ray Barnes telephoned his mother from New York City to say he had a big surprise in store for her, Vivian knew that big surprise was a new fiance, and she also knew that Mrs. Barnes wasn't going to like that one bit. Probably with good reason, if she were honest with you. That fiance was likely a no good slut. The good girls went to New York City from the small towns, not the other way around. Ruth Craven had listened in the day Ray Barnes's mother called her sister in Mansfield to complain about the fast New York City girl Raymond brought home and how she was corrupting her poor innocent boy. The Negro music he listens to now. Ruth was good enough to tell the other switchboard girls all about it and remind them about what Vivian had said. 
Some of them liked to tease her when she talked about knowing people, but they all looked at her with just a little more respect after that call. You don't need some fancy college degree or even a regular old high school diploma to know people, she'd say. Lately, there'd been almost nothing to know about anyone, and Vivian had just about fallen asleep at the console a few times. The townspeople of Worcester were talking about the dullest things you could imagine. Take this week. On Monday, Mrs. Butler complained to Mrs. Young that her daughter Maxine never called anymore, and even after she'd sent Maxine that beautiful windmill star quilt she worked so hard on. On Tuesday, Earl Archer called his wife Dora from the ticket office at the railroad depot because he'd left his wallet on their kitchen counter again and wanted her to please get on the bus and bring it to him. On Wednesday, Clyde Walsh called Ginny Frazier to ask if she'd go to the A&W with him that afternoon after he finished shoveling the sidewalk in front of his mother's house. And Ginny Frazier, for the umpteenth time, said no. Vivian had connected all these calls, and although they were dull, she'd listened in and made up her mind about them. She thought Mrs. Butler should drive herself down to Columbus, break into Maxine's house, and take that quilt back. She thought Earl should hustle his wrinkled old ass back to the house rather than making Dora take the bus in this cold weather just because he was a careless, absent-minded idiot. And she thought Jenny Frazier might want to think long and hard about her chances of doing better than Clyde Walsh. If he could overlook that frying pan face of hers, he was worth a hamburger and a root beer float at the a &W. How many boys his age still shoveled the walk for their mothers? And she'd overheard enough of Clyde's calls to Jenny to know he meant business. Vivian felt that sort of romantic devotion should be rewarded, but Mrs. Butler, Earl, and Ginny would never hear Vivian's advice and they'd be all the poorer for it. Vivian didn't always recognize the voices of the callers or the telephone numbers they gave her. Worcester was small, but it wasn't that small. If the voice or number was unfamiliar, it was impossible to know who was there on the other end of the line, but Vivian could still come up with solutions for their problems. There were days when she thought maybe the callers should know she could hear them and maybe instead of just listening, she could chime in and give them that good advice she knew they needed. They'd be all the better for it, that was for certain. But she couldn't do that. The telephone operators weren't supposed to listen in on the calls. Vivian couldn't tell you if that was a specific rule or just something that was frowned upon. It had been so long since she'd read the rules. If confronted, she would have scoffed and said there wasn't anything worth listening to anyhow quilts and forgotten wallets and the A&W, Christ. The calls that got the girls' hearts pounding and pulses racing were the ones for the hospital or the police station or fire department. Vivian had the good sense to put those calls through immediately. Although yes, she'd sometimes listen in, if only to make sure the call wasn't coming from her own house. For as clever as she was, Charlotte could be careless with the stove and she'd gotten into the habit of making popcorn after school. And Lord knew Edward was bound to cut off one of his arms with one of those sharp tools in the shed or hammer his hand to the workbench in the basement one of these days. What she'd really like to hear was something scandalous, something out of the ordinary, something like the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg business that Edward had told her about. Soviet spies. The intrigue was international news, but Vivian was mainly interested in the story because the spies had been a married couple. Now that was intrigue. And if she'd eavesdropped on a call between Julius and Ethel, you can bet your bottom dollar she'd have had some advice to give them. Based on what Vivian overheard when she was at the switchboard, there was no spying going on in Worcester. No, what was happening in Worcester was that Mrs. Butler had wasted her time making a quilt for an ungrateful daughter, Earl Archer was an absent-minded idiot who took his wife for granted, and Jenny Frazier thought she could snag somebody better than Clyde Walsh. Also, it was cold outside, Christmas was a few weeks away, and Friedlanders had a nice sober Santa Claus to remind everyone of that fact. Vivian still had hopes for something more exciting on that cold December night as she sat at the switchboard, restless, bored, humming nursery rhymes in her head, and halfway hoping to discover spies or at least scandal about a married couple in their little Ohio town. If she'd been able to push aside the farmer, his Dell, the lonely spinster cheese, and Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, she might have heard the voice of her dead granny saying what she used to say when you were asking for something that might get you into trouble. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Oh, wait. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> See you again. Very good. Um, in anticipation of your visit with us tonight, I had seen that um, Whoopi Goldberg had recommended your book as a top read during the quarantine time. Yeah, it was a year ago. I'm, I'm going to be posting about it on the 10th. I'm going to celebrate it as a, 
um, an anniversary because at the time I, the book came out March 10th and I was able to do a launch event because people were still kind of figuring things out, but it was like literally the next week, everything down. And I know personally, I didn't want to read anything other than news reports on what was going on. Like, what was this virus? What, you know, what were the symptoms? How did you get it? I was, and that went on for at least a month. And then gradually we started getting more information. Um, and so that, that um, notification didn't come through to me until May, but I guess, yeah, on The View, they had talked about what they were watching in quarantine and what they were reading in quarantine and Whoopi had picked the operator as one of her books and I was thrilled, but I felt like it was, it was so belated because it, it didn't, I didn't find out about it until like a month after it had happened. Yeah, I thought that was so cool. She, yeah, she's one of my favorites. She's so smart and funny. And to have someone that I admire, like something that I've created was really, really a thrill. Did you reach out to her at all? No, I mean, I, I tagged her. I'm, I'm really not super savvy on, on uh, social media, but I did. I, I tagged her, but I think, I don't know if she has notifications on or anything, but yeah. 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 I just thought that was so cool. I did too. Yeah. Well, you, you have gotten some wonderful reviews on the book. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm grateful for the good ones. <laughs> well, I really didn't see any bad ones, truthfully. Good. Okay. Don't keep looking. <laughs> They're there. <laughs> All right. Yeah. But um, fun, light, and intriguing with great humor and insight, irresistible, warm, sympathetic, and witty, funny, sweet, secretive, and full of fascinating period details a well-plotted comic drama. I mean, those are all wonderful. And, and they're um, here, the librarians in our group, at least in my opinion, if you get a good review from Kirkus, it must oh, be good. Yes. Because Kirkus doesn't- They can be brutal. brutal. They can be brutal. Yep. And uh, sometimes they make me laugh with what <laughs> they say about different things. <laughs> But um, the Kirkus Review says there are more than enough quotable lines to fill a couple of reviews. I was so grateful for that review from Kirkus, yeah. yeah. Because I thought that was wonderful. And then you also got a wonderful review um, from the author of The Help. Yes. Which was great too. And I love that book so much. So that was really, that was such a crucial, um, it was crucial praise. I, I felt so blessed getting yeah. that. And in her review, uh, she says, think the marvelous Mrs. Maisel in the suburbs. <laughs> My and mom loves that, loves that show. I love that show too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, congratulations. You know, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. And now your, your paperback has just been out for a few weeks. Yep. Right? Yeah. March 16th, I think was the, the actual date. Yeah. Well, I am wondering if any of our uh, participants have any questions they would like to ask Gretchen. Uh, you could unmute yourself if you like, or if you just want to type in the chat, uh, that would work. You know, whatever, whatever. <laughs> You might have I, said this. Oh. Be <clears throat> hi. Go ahead, Sarah. Hi, hi. Sarah. Yeah, hi. Okay. You might have said this before we started. I joined a little late, but how did you pick Worcester? Is that somewhere you've lived before or spent time in? That so the book is loosely based on my maternal grandmother and my family. So my mom was born and raised in Worcester, and her mom and her. So we have a long, long history in Worcester. Um, yeah, I get that question a lot. People are like, "Why did you set it there?" I'm like, "Well, that was kind of easy because that's where the stuff happened." Um, there are a number of facts in the book. It's it is based on the the main. Um, I would say the main twist, or not twist, but the main. Um, plot point is is mm -hmm. true and actually happened so yeah. neat carol did you have a question yeah um well i have a couple questions but first a comment that i really enjoyed reading the book um i read a lot of historical fiction not as much as emma um but i really loved the book it was so much fun to read i loved Thank all you. 
all the juicy secrets that, and you saved so many for the end and um, <laughs> we're, no spoilers here, but uh, so much fun reading and the character growth was awesome as well. Thank um, you. A quick question is, uh, since you guys mentioned the Whoopi comment, have the movie rights been sold? Sold, no. Um, my agent is working with a um, an agency out in in Los Angeles, and so they are they're sort of shopping it around. There was um, there was a, an actress who I absolutely adore who was interested in it, and then life life issues came up for her, and so bowed out. But yeah, there's it's. I, my agent was saying, well, you know, some of them don't get made for like eight years, and I was like, yeah, I'm not worried. <laughs> it's fine. Well, that's exciting. And then um, actually, if you could explain four flushers, I yes. mean, I'm an Ohio girl, but I've never heard four flushers. So, and it's flushers. so funny because the research that I'm doing for the book that I'm working on now, that phrase came up and I just started laughing. Um, as far as my grandparents were concerned, they thought four flushers were just the wealthy people who were, who were show-offs, just, you know, um, in actuality, a four flusher, it, it, it has to do with cards, um, but it's, it's somebody shifty who's trying to pull something over on you. So yeah, a four, it's definitely not a compliment, but it also is not how my grandma used to use it. And my mom, you know, she used to say it all the time, both my grandparents with all those four flushers. <laughs> But thank you. Sure. <laughs> I thought it had something to do with the number of restrooms in one of those fancy houses. That's what I thought. I said, does it mean that they've got four toilets? And my mom, yeah. my mom didn't even know. Like when I first started writing this, I'm like, what is a four flusher? So we, I, I had to do research on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Have you been back to Wooster since you've written your book? No, um, the writing took place, I would say like 2017, 2018. Um, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do any traveling during that time. And then since it's come out, of course there was a lot of travel restrictions, um, but I would, I'd love to go back. Wooster was really wonderful. They invited me to um, participate in their book fair, the Buckeye book fair, which is a Worcester based thing. And I did that, I think in November, but yeah, my mom's got a cousin who still, who still lives there. She's my second cousin and we would definitely want to see her. And, and I, I have really fond memories of Worcester visiting my grandparents. I feel like um, for me, the whole thing was very good. Also the surprises at the end, like, did not see those coming, but it was the um, character relationships that were really interesting and clever that nobody was really like the hero and nobody was the villain and everybody sort of had um, like an issue that they had internal and then like what people would put on them. Yep. All of those things were super fun. And then like, I could totally imagine like the potlucks, <laughs> like all that stuff. Uh, not having done those in the 50s, it's so much easier to actually like imagine how fun they would be. I'm guessing it would be much more stressful than what it sounds like. Yeah. But are, are you thinking like post pandemic, do you want to give a shot to one of those? Like a jello salad? Oh kind God, of the book? food just makes me cringe. Um, my, my mom would say, oh, that was grandma's version of a salad, like jello. Right. And I- <laughs> <Or> mayo. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten really, really responsible about the way I eat. I used to hate vegetables like up until about five years ago. Um, so now I'm so conscious of, of everything that I'm eating. And I look at the things that some of the stuff that they made and, and what they ate. Although one thing I do like is that none of, they didn't have any, a lot of processed foods. Like it was all, it was, you know, fattening, but it was still, you know, like real food. Um, right. And I think about the Crisco versus butter thing. I do know that my grandma, um, when she baked her peanut butter cookie recipe, she does use Crisco. That's very, very, it's stuck in my mind because every time I would make them, I'd have to get the Crisco up. I think that was the only cookie that I would ever use Crisco for. Hey, Crisco actually has turned out to be not that horrible. Like, oh, yeah. That's <laughs> everything old is new again. Right. Um, Lard and is I'm good. Trying to, I'm trying to figure out how to like 
say it without spoiling, but like um, sort of towards the end when the sisters are talking. Yeah. Like, mm, that was such a good, <laughs> really. I'm so glad, you, I'm really glad that you, that you appreciated that about, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, I. A friend said to me, no two people ever read the same book. And I'm sure that's a famous quote from someone, but it, but it's really true. So, I, and I know that there, I know that there were people who, who read it, who didn't, they, they didn't, they didn't appreciate the characters or it, it's, it's hard for some people to root for a character they find unlikable. And, and Vivian's character is definitely, she's really crunchy and crusty and she's got a, she's got an edge that needs to be sanded down. So yeah. But the inside. Yep. You know. <laughs> she means well. Yeah. She's squishy on the inside. Yeah. So yeah, I'm glad you like that. Now I don't I don't think this is giving away too much, but I don't remember from the book how much actual schooling did Vivian have? Only till eighth grade. Eighth grade. Grade eight at oh. Bowman School. Okay. And that was that was also my grandma. Yeah. Her um she my grandma really did used to say she didn't trust people who read books, um, which was you know, when my mom told us about that later, my sisters and, and I were avid readers, like all through our childhood and still. Um, so to hear that was really, it was, I thought it was funny. A lot of times my sisters and I laugh inappropriately at things that maybe aren't that funny, but um, we, so we just thought we were like grandma. Um, but, and then I talked to my aunt a little, a little while probably, I don't, I'd already been well into writing the book, but she thought that my grandma might have had dyslexia, which would have had an impact on, you know, her reading abilities and her enjoyment of reading. So, um, but I, I had already d decided what my plot points were going to be, and I didn't want to have to re rearrange everything, but that would kind of explain it, yeah. her reluctance to read. I did appreciate the fact that, uh, Vivian would borrow Charlotte's dictionary and look she up tried. all the time. She, yeah. and that's, you know, that's very much, I feel like my grandma, my grandma wasn't, she wasn't stupid. She was a smart lady, but um, she had, she had a real uh, insecurity about her lack of education. Yeah. And that became more apparent the older we got. My sister went to Ohio University mm -hmm. and when she graduated, we all went out and um, got together. And, and I noticed as I got older, when, when we would spend time with my grandma, she would sort of stiffen up and it was, she wasn't comfortable discussing a lot of, a lot of the things that we would talk about, you know, if we were talking about traveling or books we were reading and she would just sort of, you know, curl in on herself and, and just, oh, well, this was on sale at Bueller's. And it was, yeah, she lived a really narrow existence. And I, and I, I, I wanted her, I, I, I made the Vivian Dalton character a little bit more open and willing to try things than my grandma would have. A little bit, yeah, that's great. Other questions from the audience here? Well, I wanted to um, say that I just loved the book and I saw your interview with the um, Buckeye Book Fair in the oh, fall. Oh, you did? Okay. I like that, yeah. I went to the College of Worcester. So it was oh, you really did? fun for me as you're describing these things. Now I saw 20 years after when the book's taking place, but it was really fun to picture the streets and picture Greenlanders and, and right. that. And um, I just loved your language and Thank I just you. found, found uh, Vivian so amusing as well <laughs> as sympathizing with her. And um, yeah, but this excerpt you just read, you just have a real knack with language. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, so I totally did enjoy it. And I thought it was really neat again, as, as Stacy was saying, you don't want to give things away, but how some of these characters interconnect in ways that you wouldn't expect when, why we would revisit a Santa or so forth. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm so, so glad, thank you so much. Yeah. I remember so seeing um, something Kurt Vonnegut had, uh, some, he was talking about the process of writing a novel and he drew um, a bell curve 
and, and and it was you know supposed to be this amusing thing like it starts off slow you get to the climax and then there's there's not much left and I didn't like that I have never so when I write I don't want the big thing to be in the middle and then the rest to just be downhill so I kind of prefer mine to keep going up a little bit <laughs> mm -hmm, on an right. incline right well it was really great the ending all these pieces coming together great i'm Just so glad loved it. looking forward to your next book oh good okay have you gotten any feedback from uh citizens of wooster at all yes i have um not a lot oh my mom so my mom is on a facebook group that is um it's one of those nostalgic, you know, you know, you know, you're from Worcester when, and she sent me a screenshot where people were talking about the book and she didn't chime in, but she was really excited that, you know, people who lived there had been enjoying it. And a couple of people reached out to me saying that they grew up there and they really, you know, they connected with it and they, they enjoyed it. So that was, that's really nice and reassuring that I didn't mess anything up too badly. <laughs> Do you have a favorite character in your book? I, I really, all of the main characters I really like, even the ones who aren't that obviously likable. And, and I always, I've answered this question a couple of times. There's a, there's a tertiary character that appears like way, way, almost at the end of the book that I love. And her name is Hazel Horshatz and she is a telephone operator in Buffalo, New York. So, um, she I really I, I just enjoyed writing a little bit of her that I wrote so and yeah she would she would be one of my favorites I think I'm curious your book is available on uh, Kindle and as an audio, uh, audio right did you read the book no um nope they gave me options as far as uh, they gave me like four options to choose from for the for the for whoever was going to read it i i would have preferred i think i would have liked to have read it um but that wasn't i think the only people that really get to do that are people who are actors or actresses are really super famous like michelle obama read her own book okay. <laughs> but yeah i was just curious about that <laughs> can i give a quick shout out to the cover as well the, the paperback cover uh, which is the same as the art show, isn't it? Okay. On, on the website, there's like Who's a whole the variety. <laughs> so so this little, is um, the, yeah, this is the hardcover. And then this one is the paperback. So the, yeah, they it, kept the, the focal point. I did look on your website and uh, there are some also in like other languages with a lady, which are super charming. Yeah. And they all sort of have that, um, like the vibe yeah. Did you get to help pick that at all? Any of those? I, I did not have, I didn't really have input on with my, with the U.S. contract and the U.K. contract, I had approval, um, but that's never, yeah, it, it wasn't the same as input really. Um, and then with the, with the foreign, uh, all of the other foreign covers, I just had to see what came out and <laughs> but I was pretty happy actually um the Spanish cover and I have them here so the Spanish cover is this one oh and this image was something that I had saved I have a file full of um like inspiration that I was using and this was an image that I had saved um it's got a black background uh, it's a photograph and I thought it was so interesting when when it came through with my agent sent it to me and she said this is what they're thinking of for the Spanish cover and I was like oh I have that image in my little file uh, file folder um, and I did I just asked that they that they changed the background to something lighter because when it was the black background it was really dark and ominous and I felt like that would make the book seem like it was a little bit darker than it actually was. And I really like, this is like my favorite color blue. It's so pretty. So. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the publishers do want to keep the authors happy. So they really do what they can to listen to what the author says, but then also, you know, they have to work with their marketing team and what they think will sell and that sort of thing. 
part of your background is an interest in genealogy, right? Yes, I love genealogy. I do too. <laughs> anyway, so that influenced this story quite a bit, right? Because you found a treasure. Yeah, and that's, I, I, I don't think that I had been considering writing a novel at the time. I really was thinking, I want my career to be genealogy. I was, you know, creating reports for people and um, but when I was doing my own research on my own family, I, that I came across this little piece of information that I thought, oh, that's surprising. And, and then I thought, well, I could, you know, I could do something with that, make it into a little story. <laughs> so you're also a professional genealogist too? I was, I wouldn't say, I haven't done anything Oh, lately I've been you know I had I created a family tree for my fictional characters just so I could keep everybody straight and I'm working the same family tree for the next novel that I'm hoping to finish this week um so I I'll I'll dip into the census records every once in a while but I haven't done any really and of course you can't do anything in person right now but um I haven't done anything with land records and and all of that I've been away from it for a little while I'd have to brush up. I loved all the recipes um, that you had in the book and I can't stop thinking about those sour cream cookies. Oh, so, they're so good. So I'm a little mad at you about those, but I also loved <laughs> like in the afterward where you talked about how the recipes were actually like in your grandmother's, like the way she had them written, like with misspellings and everything that was yep. neat. Um, the whole book made me think about like how, you know, recipe cards used to be a thing and we all had like, you know, our moms all had like the tin recipe holders and, you know, I don't, I don't know that people do that anymore. And I just loved how like this kind of story, I don't know, could it exist in a day? I mean, people are still as gossipy and maybe even more so online than, than yeah. it used to be, but I don't think that this story could exist um, now. You know, people no, it don't would even be so their, different, right? They don't even use their phones to talk to each other. They're I just know. texting each other with it. Yeah. So I really loved that. And then lastly, I wonder if you would give us a sneak peek as to the title of your new book. I can't tell you the title. The title is, is something that I really, I love the title and I hope that I'm able to keep it. Um, I can tell you the character's name. Her name is Iris. And she was, she's Vivian's aunt. So um, Vivian's father is Patrick and Patrick has his own chapter at the beginning of, of this next one. That sounds awesome. I can, I can tell you that much, yeah. Carol is um, our outreach librarian here at the Rocky River Library. Oh, excellent. And have you given the book, The Operator, to some of your uh, customers yet? You know, I um, have given it to one of, uh, so far, one of my patrons who really likes historical, and I'm going to see her at the end of the week. So I'm going, to, well, I will see her through a door, but I'll make sure to ask, <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure to ask her um, her impressions. Oh, and I know that if she was internet savvy, she probably would be here today, but. Oh, yeah. Not, so, uh, but I'm, I'm guessing she's going to love it. I hope she does. I was wondering if any of the participants would want to share what they felt was either the most memorable part of the book for them or the funniest part of the book for them. And whoever has not finished it can just go like this. Yeah. Oh, I, <laughs> I, was going to, I have two parts. I was going to ask if you oh, know how many, how many foreign languages um, um, the operator's been translated into at this point and published. And then I was gonna say, as, as I mentioned before, I just how some of these characters, suddenly there's this connection. And I'm just gonna say the word banker so I don't give anything away, but <laughs> yeah, but I am interested in how many, um, how many languages do you? How many languages? Um, seven so far. Neat. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. I have, they had to push back because of COVID, they had to push back some of them. Um, the Hungarian version is going to be coming out in October. It was supposed to come out this past October, but they pushed it back an entire year, so. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there were some medical procedures that happened that seemed um, <laughs> painful. And unnecessary. Mm -hmm. 
but Tolly also worked in the story where they were. So would I want them? Heck no. <laughs> but I like I felt like it was um, like a good layer to add for the character. Like it really did match her up with kind of like what she wanted to be, who she wanted to be. And that was that was really my grandmother. That was an actual thing that she did. And my mm -hmm. mom couldn't explain why or when exactly. I was like, when did that, that happen? And she's like, oh, I no, she just always, yeah. Very strange, but very, very concerned with her appearance. And yeah, uncomfortable. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think I'm giving anything away when I say I just got a chuckle out of this line from the book. Um, this is when Vivian learns a secret and she learns the secret's name. And she says, she sounds fat. <laughs> <laughs> and that just gave me such a chuckle. <laughs> just because of her name, you know, she sounds fat. Yeah. That was, and I think, you know, today there's so much um, emphasis on body positivity and, you know, being careful, you know, you don't want to fat shame people. And back then, my grandma was pretty much always on a diet. She was obsessed with her figure and her appearance. And she even, <laughs> I was trying to incorporate this into the book. My mom, the character of Charlotte is sort of loosely based on my mom. It's, she's a, a combination of my mom and my aunt. Um, but my mom remembers my grandma had like all three kids on a diet. So they would all be drinking these weird shakes. And my mom couldn't remember what the name of it was, but it was one of these, one of those diet programs where it's a shake, mm. or I think. That was, but she couldn't remember what it was, but I thought it was so weird. <laughs> <laughs> In your uh, paperback edition, you have, uh, at least I think you do, uh, a quarantine list of things that... Um, I made those early on. I made those like last April. <laughs> yeah, that um, Vivian would do, uh -huh. right? Those are, those are very clever. Uh, or maybe. Was it quarantine or was it just her favorite oh, things? I think the quarantine. I'm sorry, it wasn't uh, quarantine. No, yeah, the, the quarantine was on my Facebook page because I did oh, at the time. Okay. I was like, you know, what would Vivian be doing? What would what would Betty be doing? And that was something funny that I could do with the characters at the time. Yeah, but for Vivian, um, for those that have read it, and I'm not sure of all what these things are. Uh, John Wayne, Lucky Strike cigarettes. Whatever Bueller's had a sale on butterscotch chips and condensed milk. And then the next one, Sen Sen licorice bits. I don't know what those are. They're little, um, they're literally just lit little licorice bits. She would like candies. She always had them in her purse. Oh, okay. High heeled shoes, sunbathing, confidential magazine, and Beulah Bechtel's hats. <laughs> now, Beulah Bechtel was a real store, correct? Yeah a long running store it was so it was it was I think they opened it around 1925 and it only closed in 1990 I think like in the 90s wow and for those of you familiar with the characters Betty's fun things are the Wooster Country Club Trowel and Trellis Garden Club the Bridge Club party planning having her portrait painted drinking Manhattans the gift corner Ladies Home was a store. Journal and Beulah Bechtel hats. <laughs> so, if you were, and that was something I don't know if everybody would or will pick up on this that um, Betty and Vivian wore the exact same color nail polish. They both wore fire and ice nail polish. <laughs> and lipstick too, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Um, the Confidential Magazine. My mom was so excited when the um, the UK paperback came out. So this is this is the UK paperback, and my mom said it looked it looks almost exactly like one of those. Um, it, they were tabloids. They were like supermarket tabloid movie magazines, and she was really excited because she said that you know this looked a lot like it, and my my grandma would read those. <laughs> yeah, it looks like Elaine has a question here. 
raising your hand. Um, I have a comment. Um, I, I enjoyed the book tremendously. My granddaughter is graduating from the College of Worcester in May. And a comment, I do belong to quite a few different book clubs. And I really like it when you don't, uh, like you say, don't do spoilers. I like it when we have read the book because there's so much that goes along with the book, the ending of it, the middle of it, and to say, oh, we can't talk about it because someone hasn't read it. Well, you know what? Read it before you come. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's how I feel. <laughs> I know here at the library, I've led some different book discussions over the years, and often people come having not read the book. Uh, Carol, I know, has led many discussions over time here at the library, and I don't know if you've run into that, too. Oh, sure. Usually I just tell them they're going to they're going to hear things that they're that they're going to want to read the book after they hear the spoilers. <laughs> so sometimes idea. you think, oh, maybe they'll forget. That's what um, I've been sending chapters of this next one to my mom for feedback, she likes to get out her red pen and, and tells me, you know, do you need a comma here? You need this here. Um, but I'm, and I'm not worried about spoilers because she immediately forgets. So anything that, that happened, you know, even halfway through the book, she'll forget it by the time she gets to the end. So it's, <laughs> it's helpful. How long did it take you to write the book? I wrote the, I wrote the first draft pretty quickly. Um, but it did change a lot. So I would say uh, the first draft took me like three months, but then it went through a couple of, of overhauls where I had to move things around and um, take out a lot. <laughs> I was telling someone, um, I, did, I did a Zoom event last week with a bookstore in Georgia, and I was talking about how um, this, last this most recent one that I'm almost almost finished with I have been cutting things out but I I'm instead of deleting them completely I put them in a different document and that document of deleted items is 150 pages long <laughs> so <Wow. laughs> it's it's hard it's really hard to you know especially if you've done a lot of research on something and you really want to include that part in the book it's really hard to get rid of it, but if it doesn't move the story along and if it doesn't really have any bearing on any of the characters, it's it's best to leave it out. So yeah, I, I have 150 pages of stuff that will not <laughs> see the light of day in this next one. Any other questions or comments from anyone? Oh, somebody's got their hand raised. Lane again. I enjoyed listening when they she was listening to Vera's conversations with the other cousins because we kind of did that at our house too because my sister was older and you really didn't hear any better but it but it was like fun <laughs> when she had the when she had the glass up to the wall yeah with the glass yeah. on the wall yeah she wanted to be included my uh, grandmother had a party line and this lady would talk for hours and hours and you would have to say, well, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, can we just make a quick call? And she'd say, make sure it's quick because she'd call back. <laughs> but it, it was really fun reading your book. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. It was really fun. I'm so glad everybody liked it. And yeah. And Had a good time reading. We'll be looking forward for your next book for sure. And good to hear. And you can come and actually visit us in person. Yeah. You guys aren't too far from us, sir. No, we're not. Yeah. And actually, it's kind of sad, but tonight we had somebody coming into the library thinking you were in person tonight. Oh. So there was a miscommunication there. So hopefully we'll be able to have you come back. Oh, can, I'd be more than happy to. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for chiming in and tuning in. And this was really great. Thanks so much. And thank you all for participating. I really appreciate it. Okay. Good night.